It's good. So we started this series called R-E. And R-E, looking it up in the dictionary, it is a prefix. There are a few words that you put onto it and it doesn't change the meaning of it. Uh, like repent. That's a Bible word. Well, repent, R-E, is not a prefix for repent. That's just the word. But there's a lot of different things. Remember, redo, uh, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to show you this. These are all the suggestions. We put it, I put it into a form that's still kind of small, but those were all your suggestions last week when we used Slido. And I'm actually using one this morning. We're going to talk about refocus. Last week, though, if you remember, we used the word rethink. And we chose to use the word rethink our identity, who we are in Christ. You're a Christ follower. You know, I've been introduced all over the world in many, many places. I've preached the gospel in 51 different countries, and I've spoken in churches and schools from Seattle to Florida, from uh, North Carolina to California, from uh, 50 miles south of the Canadian border in this little bitty town in North Dakota all the way down to Houston and all points in between. I'm not trying to brag because I don't think where I get to go and what I get to do impresses you. But I'm just telling you, it's a fact that I've been introduced in just about every denomination that you can think of. And they say pastor, they say preacher, they say evangelist. I even got introduced in Africa as an apostle, and I am not an apostle. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's just so many things that have been said about me. I've even been lied about on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, and a few things said about me that were not true. But here's the thing. All of those descriptions are what I do. They're not who I am. I am a Christ follower, bottom line. Now, because I'm a Christ follower, I want to be a great father. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a, uh, I want to be a good pastor. There's a lot of things that I get to do. There are privileges that I get to do because of who I am. They change. There's some things that I won't do because I'm a Christ follower. And then there's some things that I should do that I'm not doing because I'm a Christ follower. Hello, raise your hand if that, you identify with that. And then there are things that I do do because I'm a Christ follower that I wouldn't ordinarily do. Like I remember when God called me to preach and I was like, what? Am I going to Africa? You know, and, and I had to learn what all of that meant, what that entailed. And I'm still learning. But what, whatever label you want to put on me or on yourself, you got to figure out your identity is in Christ. It's not in your paycheck. It's not in the label that somebody else puts on you. It's not that you're a divorcee. It's not that you're a, a former drug addict. We don't know people after the flesh. We learned that last week. Go listen to it. If you didn't get to hear it, go, go to YouTube and listen to it. And then we talked about <clears throat> rethink our choices. You're faced with choices. Young, all you young people, where are all the girls? Where's Allie and where'd they go? But all hairy-legged boys up here on the front row. I like that. But you got to rethink your choices. You know, uh, they're making, you young people are making choices that are going to affect you for the rest of your life. Some of the adults and parents said what? Amen. Amen. You make choices and decisions that will affect your future. And then we as adults, we make those things. So today, I want to talk about refocus. Say that word with me. Refocus. Let's stand together and read God's word. Our jumping off point is in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. It's for the whole series. We will read this each and every week. The angel, this is verse 1, the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have per persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Man, I want, man, can Generations Church be described like that? Wow. 
Nevertheless, I have this against you. Uh Uh-oh. That you have left your first love. Done a lot of good things. That might describe some of us standing in this room. Might describe some of you online. You've done a lot of good things, but we've left our first love. We've left being a Christ follower and our allegiance that putting Jesus first in every area of our life. That's why we're talking about refocus today. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Listen to these RE words. Repent. The first one was remember. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly. Here's another one. And remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Father, we thank you for the word of God that's alive and quick and sharp and more powerful than any two-edged sword. Lord, that the scripture tells us that that Bible, that word of God, it cuts us under to the thoughts and the intents of our heart. You read our mail with the word of God. And Lord, I'm asking for you to do that today. I confess John 15, 5 over my life that you're the vine and I'm the branch. And Lord, without that connection, I can do nothing. I need you to help me preach, to speak with authority and clarity. It's not mine, but it's yours. It's your divine ability, Lord, that will help me to speak your words and help your hearers to hear your word. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church today. And Father, that you would help us to grow and become more like you today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? You can be seated. So when we started thinking about rethink last week, rethink our identity, rethink our choices, and today we talk about refocus. You know, um, for many, many, many years, Connie and I were youth pastors, and I would do a calendar every year of, and I got better at it as time went on, the ebbs and flows of working with middle school and high school students and college students. And I figured out, one of the things I figured out really quickly, that when you're working with students, the school year uh, doesn't go with the calendar year. Many times we want to, we think of refocus. We want to think about Janu- starting January. Well, we do that here at Generation Church. You, you stick around, and, and what you're going to find out, every January we spend 21 days of prayer and fa- fasting, refocusing on what God wants us to do as a church. But what I learned as a youth pastor was that the calendar for students and parents of students, therefore the calendar for youth pastors, started back then started in September and my calendar went September through August and that's how I started all of my planning was in the month of September well now you have to do that in August because school starts in August so if I was a youth pastor today I would start all of my events my back to school events and my disciple now ski trips mission trips youth camps and all the things in between those things I would start my planning in everything would start in August Well, that's where we're at. We're at back to school week. School started this week. And I think it's very appropriate that we use the terminology refocus. I've got a little tool that I use here. You say, tool? What in the world? I don't think you have any tools. Well, when you see it, yes, I do have a very little bitty toolbox in my garage. And there are real tools in it. But this is a life tool for me. This is my range finder for when I play golf. It's a tool that helps me know how far, where, I'm, where my golf ball is and where my target is. And I put this, turn this thing on. All I have to do is push it and look through it. But right now, I'm looking at the back at those buckets, and they're out of focus. So it's just like binoculars. There's a little deal that you twist it, and oh, the, the logo and all that stuff just comes right in focus. And you push it, oops, 16.7 yards to those white buckets. That's a little chip shot. It would be neat if I put those buckets on the floor, had my golf club up here and tried to (laughs) knock the ball in it. But it would take me 100 tries to do it once, so we don't have that much time. But this tool does me no good. Unless it's in focus. Zero good. And I could go another place for it. One of the cool things about this one, I used to have one that was battery operated. And the battery would run out and I would want to use it. 
And I would be on the golf course and I would pull it out and the battery would be dead. And I, oh man, I can't do it. No wonder I shot 85 that day. <laughs> no, that's a bad excuse. But this one gets charged by a USB cord. And it lasts a lot longer. But the point is, not only refocus, but recharge. Right. It's got to be charged up to work right. And there's, there's a lot of things that, that you and I do in life that if stuff is out of focus, it's just not going to work right. Can I get an amen? amen? And it doesn't have to be binoculars and it doesn't have to be some device like this. It's just your life. And I want to talk about three areas in your life that today that um, if they're out of focus, your life's pretty messed up. I want to talk about your marriage. I want to talk about your career. And I want to talk about your ministry. And under marriage, we're also talking about your family. We're talking about your kids. We're talking about your grandkids. We're talking about uh, everything in life. A lot of things come under the area of your marriage and family. <clears throat> so number one, when, you're, when we say refocus on our family, marriage and family are the centerpiece of God's representation to the world. Can you... And that is a bold statement, folks. But if, oh, thank you. Marriage is used at the very end of the book of Revelation. It makes this statement, the end of time, when the new heaven and the new earth, when the devil's been thrown into the lake of fire, when judgment has taken place, and when the new heaven and the new Jerusalem and the new earth all comes, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not the graduation. It's not the coronation. God uses the picture of marriage to mark the, one of the very last things he's going to do on earth. We collectively and, and people that are meeting in churches all over the world. Sunday was yesterday for some folks. Because there, there's people, our friends, our missionary friends in Mongolia, they're 14 hours ahead of us. They've already had Sunday. But you know what? When we meet together, we're collectively called the bride of Christ. He's using marriage as the very centerpiece of his representation to the world. No wonder marriages are under attack. No wonder that 50% of marriages fail in the, in the world. And it's 50% in the church as well. One out of every two marriages doesn't make it. That's a direct attack of Satan on the church. Because he's never changed his strategy of divide and conquer. Marriage is the centerpiece. It's about the third or fourth time I've said it. Of the, when the world outside these walls looks at the church, they want to know. And they think, they think we're weird because we're split into 328 denominations. That's a made-up number. <laughs> we can't even agree on the Bible. I say it this way. Unity on the essential and love on everything else. And notice... I use the word essential, not essentials. There's only one essential. His name is Jesus. Some of us in this room, you might be a single parent. You might be divorced in a single parent. You might be remarried in a single parent. You might be in a blended family. There's, there's just We've got every strife and kind of marriage and family that you can think of in this church right here and what those of you watching online. But you know, just like that picture, when stuff's out of focus and you're driving a car, have you ever pulled over the side of the road because the rainstorm was so bad, everything was out of focus and you couldn't see and it was dangerous? Listen, it's the same thing. When you're trying to navigate the waters of, of school, job, my granddaughter, Allie, she must be working in the nursery. Where's Allie at? She's in the nursery. She started swimming this year on the swim team. She told me the other day she's going to school at 5, going to the swim practice at 5.30 a.m. Lord, I'm praying for Jeff and Lacey. Lord. <laughs> in Jesus' name. But it's a desire in her heart. But see, you've got all of those things. 
You've got school, you've got practice, you've got choir, you've got all this stuff. You know, it'll be a month and the choir director will start having their choirs start practicing for the Christmas program. I mean, I never understood it. I mean, I understand it, but I don't understand it. We're going to get our children to swim practice at 5.30 a.m., but let the pastor or the youth pastor make demands on somebody, and they're like, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> what? You're going to let school mandate and make do- more demands on your life than God? Who remembers when there was no baseball games or football games on Wednesday or Sunday night? No, nothing was scheduled because it was sacred. Right. Nothing's sacred in that world anymore. This is what I'm saying to you, church. This is what I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you, not what I'm saying. You've got, we must collectively refocus and set a focus on our marriages on our families, on our children, on the spiritual life of our children. I learned something with my oldest child, and I regret it to this day. He's in this service today, and I don't, I've said this to him, so it's not going to be news, but I regret letting him go to work when he was 15 years old. You say, well, didn't you want to teach him a work ethic? Yeah, but that was the wrong time to do it. I never made that demand on any of my other two children because I realized I made a mistake. Because there were some things that were out of focus because of the demands that that job put on his life. I've asked God to forgive me for it. I've asked asked him to forgive me for it in conversations in the past. But you know what? You and I together as a church and as a people, you've got situations and you've got circumstances in your life and you've got children at all different ages all across the spectrum from colleges to elementary kids. This is time for you to refocus and put some spiritual things in place. Maybe there's a family devotional time. Maybe there's a family Bible reading plan that you do together. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm telling you by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and in the mighty name of Jesus, it's time to refocus your family life. Because this world is not going to help you make a better family. The world is going to make more demands on your family that's going to divide and conquer. Jesus wants to bring your family together and get you unified and moving in one mind, in one accord, in one purpose. And I'm begging you men to step up. Step up and be spiritual leaders in your house. Step up and recognize that as a leader, you need to refocus. Quit prostituting your role as a leader in your home to your wife. God called you to be a leader. God called you to be the head of your household. Don't even prostitute it to the church. The church is not going to lead your children. The church, we're going to partner with you as parents. We're going to take your kids to the same place you want to take them. We're coming beside you. This youth ministry is, we're beside you. We're helping you. Awanas, we're helping you. We're coming up beside you and adding our amen and so be it to what you're already believing for and seeing happen in your family. That's our desire. You build your family well, you'll build the kingdom of God. And that's a guarantee. The second thing I want to talk, oh, let's talk about, um, look at the scripture. The first marriage, Genesis 2.18 It's the first thing God saw that he said was not good. He said, he created man, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a what? Okay. God didn't give you your wife so you could dominate her. He gave you the gift of your wife so that she could be your helper. 
She could come up beside you and help you and comparable to him. Look at the next few verses. This is where it happened in verse 21. The Lord God caused deep sleep to fall on Adam. First anesthesia ever happened right there. And he slept. He took one of his ribs, closed in up the flesh in its place. Then the, <clears throat> then the rib, which the Lord had taken from him, he made into a woman. And he brought her to man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Not woe man. Three of you got that. <laughs> woman. Helper. You know what Connie always says about this story right here? She says, there was a lot in that rib. <laughs> now I'm going, amen, sister. There was a lot in that rib. <laughs> First marriage. And it was not between two men. Nor was it between two women. It was between a woman and a man. But God created it. It's not good that man would be alone. So there is a focus from the book of beginnings. There's a focus on the family. Number two, we need to refocus on our careers. You know, there's no such thing as secular and sacred. If I had a soapbox up here, I'd be standing on it right now. Everything in your life is sacred. If you want to put this in, you, you've got a sacred box and I'm going to put church, I'm going to put my Bible, I'm going to put spiritual things in my sacred box, and your sacred box is going to be about this big. And everything else is going to be secular. That is, there's no, there is no biblical foundation for that. None. Your entire life, A to Z, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, and even after you go to bed, Everything is sacred should be dedicated to God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 says this. Whatever you do. Now what does that include? Everything. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Says the same thing six verses later. He says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Where's the separation of secular and sacred in that text? And in many texts. I mean, we could, I, I just boiled it down to this one because it's the simplest one. But love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Greatest commandment. Where's the secular and sacred in that? There's not any. Your career, your marriage, your family, everything in your life ought to be committed, dedicated. You ought to do everything, everything in your life, everything in my life should flow out of my relationship to Jesus. If you're a school teacher, you're, you say, well, the state pays my paycheck. Well, the Lubbock Independent, no, your first commitment is to Jesus. Everything flows from your personal relationship to Jesus and his leadership of the Holy Spirit to you, through you, through the word of God. And you acknowledge that and you do that. And I'll tell you what, things will go well for you. Amen? Number three, your ministry. Refocus the ministry. You say, my ministry, I'm not a pastor. Did you know that Biblically, every single person in here that names Jesus as their Savior, you're in the ministry. Right. Right. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, and don't worry guys, there's not a scripture on it. It just talks about the gifts, the ministry gifts that God gave to the church. The pastor, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, and the uh, apostle. And these are ministry gifts that he gave to the church to build the church up, to edify the church, to, so that the church could be full-time in the ministry. 
That's why you've got to see your career as a ministry. That's why you've got to see your finances, the finances that come along with your career. You need to see, like we talked about, you've got to put God first in your money. You've got to put God first in your career, in everything. All your choices in life need to be flow through the filter of who Jesus is in you. a very familiar story and I think the scriptures I don't know if they'll be on the screen or not I can't remember if I put these in there or not but it says this is the story of Peter's confession of who the church is of who Jesus is Jesus asked the disciples in Matthew chapter 16 in verse 13 he said who do men say that I am and they said some say you're Elijah some say you're Jeremiah some say you're one of the prophets and Jesus and by the way as a Christ follower you've got to answer this question but Jesus said who do you say that I am every person in this room every one of you online at some point in your life you're going to have to say who Jesus is to you you're going to if you're young if you're old You're going to have to, at some point, you're going to have to say, Jesus is my Savior. That's who Jesus is to me. So Peter, after these guys gave their opinions, Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets, Peter speaks up and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus gives him the biggest pat on the back, says, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. One translation reads, you didn't get this from a human. (laughs) In other words, what Jesus was saying to Peter, you downloaded this straight from heaven, buddy. Can you imagine Peter's chest going, yeah, I did, didn't I? That's the picture I get of Peter anyway. He's going, yep, look at me, boys. You received this revelation from my Father in heaven. From this day forward, we're going to change your name. It's going to be Little Rock. And then he says, but we're going to build my church on the big rock. And the gates of hell cannot stand against it. He even goes further and says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you speak, it's going to happen. Well, okay. Peter's like... (laughs) Can you, can you imagine him strutting around? <laughs> you said, Jeremiah, you were off. Well, then Jesus changes the subject. He says this. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The priests, the elders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they're going to try to kill me. <laughs> Peter is feeling his Wheaties. He pulls Jesus aside, pulls him off, and he says, no, let's let's just read what what the text says down here. Verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, so now you get to rebuke Jesus because you heard from heaven. (laughs) How many of you know Peter was dumber than a hammer? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, this shall not happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. One minute he heard from heaven and now he's full of the devil. (laughs) What in the world is going on? (laughs) Some of you parents go, That's my child. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. One minute he's praising him, now he's an offense to him. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Can I make a suggestion to you? And this is just, I didn't read this in a commentary somewhere. This is just my, the workings of my crazy brain. Here's what happened. One minute Peter is hearing from heaven. The next minute he's being motivated by Satan. Peter lost his focus. I don't know about you. I've been there and done that. One minute, I'm being used by God. The next minute, I'm yelling at my wife. (laughs) True, true story. And what happened? 
happens to all of us is we're moving down this thing called life. Here we are. We've got a great opportunity to refocus our family and marriage. We've got a great opportunity to refocus our career. We're just going to roll everything into one because school's starting, traveling's done, vacations are done. We've got a chance to refocus our ministry. Lord, where do you want me to serve? Where do you want me to plug in? Where do you want me? What growth group do you want me to get in? Where do you want me to fit? Do you want me to work with the Awanas? We need some men in Awana. And children, you know, we got to get plugged in. Lord, where do you want me to go? Well, you get focused. You know, the Lord's speaking to you this morning. I guarantee you, he wants you to get refocused. In all of those areas. You get in your car and drive out of here and you get a phone call from somebody and all of a sudden you're in a bad mood. We've all been there. So how in the world... Do we keep focus? And I want to pause for just a second. I was going somewhere with that thought, but I want to interject something. If you're taking notes off the, on the back of the bulletin, you can just put this off to the side. I want to talk to you because we also, as a PMT, pastor's management team, that's what most churches call their staff. We call it PMT. They're the elders of our church. They do ministry. And we've introduced them to you before, and we'll probably do it again before long. But for years, we've done some really important things. Our vision, and they're going to show you this slide, our, the vision of our church is touch the city, teach the nation, train the world. Touch, teach, train. It's really simple. If, you've never, if this is the first time you've heard it, that's why I'm interrupting my sermon, for you to see the vision and mission of our church. Under the heading of touch the city, we've done some really big things around here. For example, when school started, we've even had some people ask us, well, where did the backpack giveaway go? When we go to the park and we cook the hot dogs and we uh, paint faces and we do dramas and we have a show and then you get up on that trailer that we get and you give an altar call and a hundred or so people give their life to Christ and we give them all Bibles. Where did that go this year? And then October rolls around Halloween comes in, and we don't celebrate Halloween around here. We want to flip the script, and we call it trunk or treat. And we get a bunch of cars. We get members of our church to fill their trunks with candy. You know, you may or may not know this, but McLean Food, last year, they gave us candy that was valued at $6,000 for our trunk or treat. Look at, uh, you know, you, that's right. You quit working there, didn't you? I forgot. But we still get it. We're, we're online to get it this year. Again. And that's what we use. We fill those trunks up. And last year we did three shows. We did three little, we had a big flat trailer out there. And we did three shows. And we, we moved six, seven, eight hundred people through our parking lot. Every single Halloween. Well, we're not going to do that this year. And we didn't do the backpack giveaway. Because here's what happened. We refocused as a team and as a staff. Because we would have those great big huge altar calls and nobody would come to church. We were spending thousands of dollars and man hours to just have a decision. I don't read anywhere in the Bible that Jesus preached for decisions. Jesus, even Matthew 28, the Great Commission says go make disciples so one of the ways that you make disciples you've got to engage people you've got to get them in and you've got to teach them you've got to train them you've got to teach their kids so we've refocused our awanas we've retooled our our um, children's ministry the youth ministry is focused on this that we are making disciples so what did we do at the end of vbs this year we had a very detailed registration process where we collected every bit of data that they would let us have. And when it came time for the backpack giveaway, we sent emails, we sent texts, we sent every avenue that we could get to get those people into the building on August the 4th, that was two weeks ago, to do the backpack giveaway. Well, we've got families attending church because of that now. We've got, we zeroed in and got a laser focus on people that we knew we could disciple and not just make decisions. Does that make sense to everybody? So here's what's going to happen when it comes um, 
trunk or treat time. We're not going to do that either. We've gonna, we designated Sunday, November 7th. Mark it down, write it down. You'll start seeing it in the bulletin. Sunday, November 7th is Friendsgiving Sunday. We're going to do a buildup where we reach, those, reach out to those same people from BVS that were in our building. And then we're going to ask you, we're going to give you a piece of paper, and we're going to target three people that you know, and we're going to give you tools, we're going to give you times, we're going to give you dates, we're going to put things in your hand, and we're going to move toward that November 7th Friendsgiving Day, a play on Thanksgiving, Y'all follow with me? But we're going to make a targeted, laser-like approach and not just people making decisions, but get them in the building where, yes, it starts with the decision, but we want to begin to disciple them. Amen. And we want them to see what we have to offer. Instead of just shotgun. <laughs> shotgun with the gospel. Well, yeah, people make decisions, but... How many of you know it's more than a decision? Come on, somebody. Wave at me. Say amen. Say, if I'm making sense, say amen. Some of y'all are looking at me like a cow at a new gate. Come on, man. But we're making, I'm preaching about this, but we as a team, as a leadership team, we're making, we're refocusing our assets and our tools so that we can disciple people not just make decisions there'll come a place there'll come a time where we'll do the shotgun approach again I'm sure but we're just going to shift our focus is that okay with everybody yeah. teach the nation things like Emmaus it was far, way more far reaching than, than Lubbock Texas Emmaus the Emmaus walk was and there were many of our Connie was the spiritual director for that. And there was many of, uh, we had three or four of our people attended. We had people in leadership. And then I was there. Dave Menifee, Dave preached in our church. And Dave and I were the only men there. It was kind of weird, but it was, it was okay, you know. But we're just, you know, when I get invited to go preach somewhere else in the nation, we're touching, teach the nation. I'll be in January, I'll be in Chicago doing a Chicago Land Airy Men's Conference. And just, just things like that. Touch the world, train the world. Pastor Connie and, and Mitzi and her dad are going to Estonia in about three weeks. And there's a pastor's conference going on of, of pastors that are starting new churches in Eurasia, in the in that in the uh, 1040 window in the United States, the least area of people that there are churches uh, anywhere, and they're all church planters. Well, Connie and Mitzi and Emery are going to uh, be the hospitality team for those pastors. They're going to be the ones that are praying. They're going to be the ones that are serving. They, uh, Connie's got a whole boatload of ideas of uh, those of you that did go to Emmaus, all the agape style stuff y'all got in your room. That's what they're going to do for all these pastors. They're just going to love on them. But we're going to be sending them. We're going to help send them. And they're going to train the world. Connie and I have an invitation to go to Sierra Leone and do a marriage conference for pastors. Not just a marriage conference, but it's a marriage conference for pastors. How I many of you know that's something that's needed? And so we, the, the date hadn't been set for that. But we are about, you know, we're not just having church on Sunday morning. The kingdom of God is bigger than that. Amen? Amen. It's not, come on, look at your neighbor and say it's not just us four and no more. As your pastor, man, my, my vision's huge. I mean, let, matter of fact, my vision's so big, we're going to stop and interrupt my sermon, and we're going to pray for our piece of land right now. Stick your, stick your hand out over here. Father, we pray for that uh, piece of property behind us. We thank you for, I haven't even asked for money, and people have started giving money. 
And Father, we just thank you that Rick Dykes, Lord, uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying his name, I don't know. But Father, we just pray that they'll be moved upon to donate that property. And Lord, we're just thanking you. We're praying big things, Lord. We thank you for the building we'll build that'll be a fellowship hall, a wonderful kitchen storage. And Lord, we can quit paying rent on the offices and have offices in our church building. God, I just thank you that you're doing miracles, that we're going to have a space and a place for our face and our friend's face. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. You got a big vision? Is this helping you? Okay, I'll go back to my message now. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, that was a commercial. Have you ever had a commercial break in the middle of one of your TV shows? You know what I do now? I record them all, so I just speed through the commercials. You didn't get to speed through that. All right. <laughs> okay. No, I'm done. I looked up there at the clock, and if I got started on this next part right here, you'd be here for another time that you don't want to be here that long. I will uh, finish this. I'll leave you wanting more, and I will finish this. Because here's what I'm going to do. Next Sunday, you don't want to miss it. I, t I, I taught you about the things that God wants us, I believe by the Spirit of the Lord, He wants us to be refocusing on our families, our careers, and our ministries. Well, the only thing I haven't taught you yet, and that was the next piece, is how do you refocus? I am going to literally give you a five-step plan that no matter where you're at in your life, it will teach you, no matter whether it's your career, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your parenting, whether it's your ministry or your vision, I'm going to give you five principles that literally you can plug those five things into any area of your life and make it work. So you don't want to miss next Sunday. You want to and bring a friend with you. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the wonderful people that have been online and listening. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their needs. We pray that you meet them right where they're at. God, and I pray for those that have been in the room with me today that, Lord, they've been such a good listening audience. And God, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit has been speaking to them. I pray that there's a nugget. I pray that there's a truth I pray that there's a new idea about their career or their marriage or their ministry. Lord, that there's something that you connected to their heart. And Lord, that you're speaking to them. Lord, there's people within the sound of my voice right now that they heard something from you and they went off on a whole nother tangent. And Lord, that's okay with me because you're speaking to them. And Father, I thank you for that today. Lord, I want the ability to pray for those individuals. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. And I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. All I'm going to simply ask you to do is raise your hand in the privacy and the confidence of every head being bowed and every eye being closed. If you know that the Lord dropped a nugget, a truth, a thought down into your heart and into your spirit today, there's a point of obedience there's a refocusing that needs to take place in your life. And the Lord used these last few moments just to, like a laser beam, like a laser beam, just zero in on your personal life, on your family, on where you're at in your career, on where, you at, where you're at in ministry. I'm just going to count to three. And if you will acknowledge that the Lord has spoken to you today. I'm going to pray for you. One, two, three. Lift your hand up. There's hands going up all over this room. You can put them down. Father, I thank you for receptive hearts, obedient hearts. God, that they will take these truths, they will take these thoughts, they will take these concepts and ideas that you planted deep down inside them. And Lord, they will act on them.
and just hearing a word from the Lord. And I don't, I don't, there's not a person per se that it's for. So I'm just going to speak it. You just keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. The book of James talks about a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And there's someone, maybe online, maybe in the room, that you're bouncing back and forth. And all it's doing is bringing confusion. And the Lord says, I have a plan for your life. And it's not to be double-minded. So, Lord, what I'm going to pray for these people, this, whoever this is, Lord, I'm going to pray that they hear a clear, 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 clear word from you. Lord, even give them a scripture, a promise to stand upon. guide them, Lord. Again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking. If double-mindedness describes you, one, two, three, lift your hand up and put it right back down. There's one, there's two. Anybody else? Father, that double-minded man, that double-minded lady, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that there will come a clarity about what you want to do in their lives. Lord, use the Bible. Use people that love them. Use sermons or messages or songs. Lord, there's so many ways that you can get our attention. Lord, make it clear. Make the path clear. Psalm 37, 23 says the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. There's a Hebrew word picture for that scripture, and it means the father is teaching a child to walk, and he picks up one foot and puts it, reaches over and picks up the other foot and places it. The steps of a righteous man or woman of God, they're ordered of the Lord. Receive that in the name of Jesus. While we're still and calm and quiet in the presence of the Lord, I've got to ask you, there's never going to be a Sunday at Generations Church. It'll be a special Sunday if, if it happens that you're not going to, you're going to hear me not ask for people to receive Jesus. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon said that he has put eternity in the hearts of men. I believe that's true. There's a hole in the heart of men, women, and children. You have a hole on the inside of you. Because in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it says God breathed his spirit into man. And in chapter 3, Adam and Eve were disobedient. and That left a vacuum. And you're standing here, sitting here, you're online with me today, and you know that you know that you know Jesus is not the Lord of your life. Today, today is the day of salvation. Eternity is in your heart. He's pulling you. He's wooing you. He's drawing you into his arms today. It's not condemnation. It's conviction. I'm going to say it again. It's not condemnation. It's conviction that says you need to surrender your life to Jesus. You know it's you. Your heart's beating really fast right now. You know what that means to you? You haven't gone too far. He's still calling. He's still wooing. They're going to put Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10 up on the screen. I want everybody to look at it. Because this is how you get saved. It's really simple. You confess with your mouth. You believe with your heart. And the Bible says you will be saved. Well, preacher, what do I confess? You confess you're a sinner. And you need a Savior. Yeah, it's humbling. But it's the best decision of your life. And then what do you I believe? Well, I believe that Jesus loved me so much that he died on the cross for me. 
that he was buried, and then he rose again on the third day like he promised. And right now he's sitting at the right hand of God praying for you to make the best decision of your life. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make it really simple for you. We're going to pray a prayer, all of it. We're going to, all of you online, we're going to pray a prayer all together. You pray with us. You ready? Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for loving me that much. I confess I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Will you come into my heart? Will you be my Lord and Savior? I repent. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my old life. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. I have been in charge far too long. Would you come in and be the charge of my life? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person that prayed that prayer in sincerity. Lord, they're either coming back to Christ or for the first time in their life, they're saying, yes, 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 I surrender to Jesus. Lord, we thank you for them. If you're online and you were serious and you prayed that prayer for the first time, our media team was waiting on you to type into that link, I prayed with the preacher today. And if you'll let them know, we will send you. I've got a little book, a little gift I want to give you. It's called Now What? What do you do next? And I want to send this to you. If you're in the room with me today and you were sincere, you say, Pastor, I was serious. I asked Jesus into my heart for the first time. I surrender. I came back to the Lord today. That's a great decision. I say it this way, the best decision ever. Amen. Let's say it together. The best decision ever. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed with you today. Anybody over here? Right here? Zach, I believe it, buddy. We're going to pray for you today. Amen. Amen. Anybody over here? Anybody over here? Come on, Zach. Come up here and let the church pray for you. Sonia, come on. Dan, come on. Mama and Grandma. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this young man. God, Zach, this isn't the first time Zach's heard the gospel. But Lord, he took a courageous step and said, I need to surrender today. And Father, make this, make this a special moment. Come on, church, stretch your hands out. If you're a grandma, if you're a mother, come on. Just be- They've been believing for this. Lord, this is a monumental moment for Zach. Lord, this is a day, a time, and a space in his life where, Lord, he gets to refocus. He gets to redo. He gets a redo. He gets another chance. Not a second chance, but another chance, God. Lord, deliver him. Lord, everything that is not of God in his life, Lord, just jerk it right out of his life. And, Lord, give him a hunger and a thirst for righteousness like never before. Lord, I pray that you baptize him with the desire to read the Word of God. And Lord, that he would get a version and a translation that he understands. And Lord, that you would just put that desire in his life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice. Father, we wish rejoice. Oh, Father, we thank you today. We thank you for what you're doing today. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Woo! Whitney, I've watched Easton's water baptism about 10 times. You know why? Because I loved his declaration. Why are you doing this? Because Jesus said so. Man, if we would live our lives with that kind of simplicity, every single solitary one of us in this room would be so much better. Because Jesus said so. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, I pray over Generations Church today. What a privilege to be their pastor. Father, we love them. We pray that, I, Lord, as I speak this benediction over them, I'm just praying, Lord, that you do wonders, you do miracles that only you can do this week. While I'm praying, I want my prayer team to come and stand at the prayer rails and prepare to minister to people. 
if you're here today and you have a prayer request that you want somebody. You know, how many of you know some, some days Jesus just needs a face? If you want somebody to pray with you, there's people coming and standing up here at these prayer rails, and you can come and you can find a person to pray with. I'll be standing right here, my left and your right. Father, we just pray that people will go out and know we're going to refocus. We're going to refocus our marriage. We're going to refocus our family. We're going to refocus our, our career and our ministry. And it, we're going to be led by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday.